So, let's get after this. So what do we care about in finance? We care about cash flows. Why are we caring about cash flows? What do we need to pay our bills? Cash. Can you pay bills with accounts receivable? No. Can you pay bills with inventory? No. And so we really have to have cash in order to be able to pay our bills. And as we discussed last time, if you don't pay your bills, what happens? Starts with a B. Mr. Sedai? Bankruptcy. Thank you very much. Okay. So that's why cash flows are so important to us. And so we're interested in two things. Number one, the identification of cash flows, and number two, the timing. Let's start with identification of cash flows. Do I have any accountants in the room? Okay, good. I'm not going to insult anybody then. So accountants have some weird thoughts. Um, they talk about net income, and they act like that's cash. But is it? No. It's not cash because it, uh, it's got depreciation subtracted out. What the hell? It's got depreciation subtracted out, and it's got um, so all sorts of non-cash stuff in it, and it also has sales that you made on accounts receivable, so those are not uh, cash receipts, right? You, you don't have the cash yet. And they also have costs that are still accounts payable, so you don't have any cash that flowed out from that yet. And so net income, you can actually have a positive net income and go bankrupt. Because what if all your sales are bringing you accounts receivable, but all your suppliers require cash? You could be in a world of hurt. So we're interested in identification of cash flows, and a lot of times what we end up doing is having to back those cash flows out of accounting numbers. And that's one of the things that we cover in Chapter 2 that you're supposed to have learned in Financial 8600 and all your accounting classes before you came here. But if you haven't, I have kindly provided you with the video to teach you how to do that. The second thing is the timing of cash flows. And the timing of cash flows is important for at least two reasons. Any ideas? The uh, time value of money. Yeah, time value of money. We all know that a dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year from now, especially now that we have 8% inflation, right? And so definitely the timing is important for the time value of money. But there is one other important reason timing is important. Can anyone guess what that is? So current assets, current liabilities, we uh, talk about current assets being things that are going to bring us cash within a year, and current liabilities are going to be things that require cash within a year. And so if my current assets are greater than my current liabilities, I might feel that I was OK. But what if my current liabilities were coming due in six months? and I wasn't actually going to have the cash until nine months, then I've got a problem. And so the timing of cash flows is also important for the fact that we just need cash at certain times to do certain things. Questions? Okay. Now let's talk about the goal of financial management. This is something that's getting, uh, getting obscured even now among people who are previously good financial thinkers, let's talk about these different things. Um, number one, first of all, who are my marketing people here? Okay, so quite a few of you. Um, should we be looking to beat our competition slash maximize our sales and or market share? Is that what we should be focused on? When I used to work in industry and I would see the accounting guys um, hang, or not the accounting, the marketing guys hanging out at the water cooler. They'd say things like, hey man, did you see the market share numbers for last month? They were off the charts, man. And then they like high five each other. <laughs> That's not dignified. Okay, back to the story. Um, and so they, they would really get hot over that. But here's the problem. You can chase market share and drive yourself into a hole. How could you do that? What's one way to improve your, your increase your market share? Undercut the competition. And how are we going to do that? Um, we have to lower our? Yeah, lower our margins. Uh, lower your price, and that leads to lower profits, unless you can also cut your costs. Uh, one example there, Costco keeps the price of that ridiculous hot dog at, what, $1.50? And uh, their, their margins kept going. Uh, so what did they eventually do? 
They cut their cost by cutting out Hebrew National, and they came up with their own hot dog plant. So now those hot dogs are manufactured in their own plant. Um, most people don't manage to cut their costs like that. And so a cautionary tale is a company called General Motors. Are you guys familiar with the General Motors? Yeah. And so if you roll back in time to the early 1970s, General Motors was on top of the world. And then there was this little thing called the Arab oil embargo. And the price of gasoline went through the roof. And General Motors is making cars with 455 cubic inch engines that get like four miles to the gallon. And I remember gas when it was 45 cents a gallon, and my dad had a 400 cubic inch engine in his Ford, and we were walking, just driving around, you could just hear the sucking noise as you drove, right? But then, 1973 happens, what do you think happened to gasoline prices? They went up, right? And so, in, uh, and I remember 1979, when gasoline went over a dollar a gallon, we thought the end was coming, right? We thought that was, that was the end times, right? But back to the story. Uh, do you think General Motors was in a good position to weather that storm? No. They had been manufacturing, and basically after World War II, the U.S. had been the chief industrial power in the world because all the other people, like Germany and Japan, had had their industry destroyed. We were the only untouched nation. And so we cruised for a long time on that. So we cruised into this oil crisis in 1973. Toyota, on the other hand, has been making small, fuel-efficient cars that, have, that are actually reliable. It's just an amazing concept, right? And so Toyota, and back then it was called Datsun, now it's called Nissan, they start to import cars into the United States. The cars are cheaper, they're more reliable, and uh, Americans eventually gave up their, their jingoistic love of the American car and started buying these things. And I knew that the end was coming for General Motors when my dad's hunting buddy, Wayne, bought a Datsun B210. I'm like, holy crap, that's the end for them, right? Okay, so. What does G, how does GM respond? Well, GM could have responded by making better cars. They could have responded by making more fuel efficient cars, right? That would be, that would make sense. But what do they do instead? Eh, we'll just cut the price to maintain our market share. Fine, but what does it do to profitability? It keeps going down, right? And so it keeps going on and on and on until finally, what happens with General Motors in 2008? Bankruptcy. And in fact, General Motors was down to the point where the money that they made on each car they sold was just enough to cover the health benefits for their retirees. Right? Whew. So, you can actually destroy yourself by trying to maximize or even just maintain your market share. And by the way, were they even successful? No. They just slowed the decline of their market share. Okay, what about minimizing costs? Minimizing costs. Any of you guys know Jim's Steakhouse here in town? Have you ever been? Yes. Is the steak pretty good? I don't know. I'm allergic to beef. She's allergic to beef. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's horrible? It's horrible. It's horrible. It's horrible. Like, I can't <laughs> okay, so uh, let's, let's imagine a steakhouse that you enjoy. <laughs> or in your case, a chicken house that you... <laughs> Is there such a thing as a chicken house? I guess Popeyes, right? Okay, back to the story. <laughs> So, now, let's assume that the owner of this steakhouse is out back smoking a cigarette, because most restaurant people do smoke, and he's out back smoking a cigarette, and a guy pulls up in a truck, and the truck has on the side of it, has a horse. And the guy gets out of the truck, and he says, hey, are you the owner of this place? And the, and, and the, the owner says, yeah. He says, how would you like to pay half price for your meat? What does the owner say? I would love to. I'm listening, right? And he says, well, how, how can you pull that off? And the guy says, we have horse meat. <laughs> yeah, we sell horse meat. I, so sometimes I have to explain to my Chinese students that Americans love horses. Because, Not to eat. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, so we don't, eat, we don't eat horses or pets. We just don't, right? So back to the story, and, and they'll tell me that you know, so I was actually in China for the dog meat festival, so I'm not like saying stuff that I don't know about, right? I was there. I saw it. Back to the story. 
Boy, you guys are getting all your cultural competency points today. <laughs> okay, so, um, and, and so then the, the steakhouse owner says, wow, that's a great idea. And so they start buying the horse meat. Now, uh, every place has regulars, and uh, the regulars will come in, and they'll order the same thing they always have. And so I order the filet mignon. You guys know what that is, filet mignon? Okay. And so, but it tastes a little gamey and a little tough. And so I call the owner over, and I'm like, hey. He's like, oh, how's everything? I'm like, it's great, but the steak is a little off today. It tastes a little different. He says, that's because we're using horse meat. He says, in fact, what you're eating is now the Philly mignon. <laughs> right? Never mind. Okay, so what do I do? I'm a polite American. I'm going to pay the bill and I'm going to tip because the waitress was not involved in this debacle, right? But am I going to go back? No. And I saw the same thing happen with Hershey's during the financial crisis. They started substituting vegetable oil for cocoa butter. And you can, if you want to know what cheap chocolate smells like, just walk down the candy aisle during Easter time. And that's all that vegetable oil nasty chocolate. My wife and I were in the grocery store and I'm like, I smell cheap chocolate and it's not Easter. And there was a display of Hershey bars. I'm like, oh man, they have made a huge mistake, right? If I want cheap chocolate, I'll pay less and get cheap chocolate. Okay, so you can destroy your business by trying to minimize costs. What kind of costs should we be trying to get rid of? How about ones that don't bring value to our customers? We should be trying to get rid of costs that don't bring value to our customers. So, for example, um, I get razor blades from Amazon.com. And those razor blades come in that awful packaging that they use on the shelf at Walmart to keep people from stealing it, right? You're almost certainly going to get injured trying to open the darn thing. And it's just a real pain. And so what if they instead sell through Amazon, who doesn't have to worry about thievery, sell, sell to them in the frustration-free packaging? It's going to cost less. It's going to be better for the customers. It's a win all around. Those are the kinds of costs we should be looking to get rid of. Now, what about maximizing profits? Maximizing profits sounds like a great idea. So let's talk about one way that we can maximize profits. Uh, in case you're unfamiliar with accounting in the United States, you must account for all of you, you must uh, expense all of your research and development um, during the year in which it was incurred. Now, I've got a, oh, I do, yeah, it's right there. Um, I've got an iPhone 12 mini, and uh, it came out in 2020, I think. Um, when do you think the R&D was done for that? Yeah, it was done beforehand. And so in those years, Apple was, by the way, geeks are expensive. Apple's paying all these geeks to work on this thing. And they're going to invest millions and millions and millions of dollars. And they're not going to see a single penny of benefit in those years for that investment. And so they could actually maximize their profitability, at least in the short run, by halting R&D expenditures. Now, you guys are probably too young to remember the Motorola Razor, the original. You guys know about the Motorola Razor? Oh, my goodness. So everything up until then was, uh, it's like about this size. <laughs> uh, maybe I'm exaggerating, but it was awful. And then we saw the Motorola Razor, and I'm like, that's got to be the sexiest phone I have ever seen in my life. But I was unfortunately on a two-year contract with one year left. Right? So finally, a year passes, and I get my Motorola Razor, and everybody wants the Razor. And then, so what do you think we're happening at, for sales at Motorola? Yeah, they're going up. And so, and what's happening to profitability at Motorola? It's going up. Yeah, it's going up. Oh, come on. So today is the um, university's emergency drill day. I am, so let's talk about what would happen if we had an active shooter. Do you see any way for us to lock that door? No. If we don't have the keys, probably not. Exactly. Do you think they trust me with keys? They should. They should, but they don't. This is the first university I've worked at where they wouldn't eat. I don't even have a key to the departmental office. Wow. 
Yeah, I know. We okay. Do. <laughs> you do? We have to go to our office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess I need to take a demotion so I can get a key. <laughs> Back to the story. Um, what we'll do is we'll turn the lights off and we'll hide. And uh, so uh, I, I've got two or three athletes in here. Maybe we'll arm them with heavy things. So uh, just in case someone happens to come in here. One thing you could do is take a belt or something of that nature and wrap it around the accordion arms on the top there. And that, if you stop those, uh, the it's OK. Raise your hand if you're wearing a belt. Very good. So we've got backup, right? OK. I'm wearing one, too. So we're all good. Thank you. That's an excellent tip. OK. So that's my, that's my little safety spiel. So there we go. OK. Now, let's talk about what Motorola did. Motorola ceased ex investing in their R&D. We didn't realize it at the time, but they did. And then their very next phone that came out was spelled, you know, since Razor was like R-A-Z-R. -R. And the next thing they come out with is called the Pebble. Why the Pebble? Because it looks like a rock. Now, one of the great things about the razor was when you put it in your back pocket, it barely showed. What do you think it looked like when you put the pebble in your back pocket? <laughs> yeah, you got some issues, right? Okay, especially if you try to sit. It's a bad, bad deal. Um, so, uh, what do you think happened? Do you think the pebble was a big hit? No, in fact, they might as well call it the turf, right? Because it was, nobody wanted one. <laughs> And so, as a result, what happened to the sales at Motorola? What happened to the profit at Motorola? What happened to the stock price at Motorola? Went down. In fact, it got so cheap that Google bought the entire company just for the patents, and then separated the patents from the rest of the company and sold the carcass to a Chinese company called Lenovo. You can still buy Motorola phones today, they're not actually Motorola, they're, uh, they're Lenovo phones. But you probably wouldn't buy them if they were called Lenovo because you think Motorola, that's a brand you recognize, right? That's a cautionary tale. They were trying to maximize their profits and it came back to bite them. Now what about um, maintaining steady earnings growth? Which would you prefer, a stock whose earnings growed 3%, 3%, 3%, 3%, 3%, or 2%, 5%, 3%, 9%, 4%, 12%, 12%, which one would you prefer? Yeah, the second one. And so maintaining steady earnings growth, you'll actually hear CEOs say that that's something that they aim for. That is not, not, not the goal of financial management. So as you might have guessed, the goal then is to maximize shareholder Wealth, maximize shareholder wealth. Now, for people who are uninitiated, uninitiated in that, in the idea, they might think that, oh, this is a bunch of greedy shareholders and they're just out for their own. Da, da, da. Yeah, okay, so let's talk about why maximizing shareholder wealth actually makes sense from an everyone perspective. Let's talk about the way cash gets handed out at corporations. When a corporation makes money, the first people in line to get that money, whether it's uh, from their operations or a bankruptcy, is the government. What does the government expect? Taxes. Taxes. And then right behind the government, you're going to find um, the employees. You're going to find uh, some debt holders, the banks, some bond holders. And then you're going to find preferred shareholders, which we'll talk about in Chapter 6. And all the way at the back of the line are the common shareholders. The common shareholders have what we call a residual claim. And remember last time we said residual means? Leftover. And so these people only get what's left after everybody else gets paid off. Therefore, if I'm making this last person in line rich, what does that mean I've done to every other single entity in this line? Yeah, I had to have paid them off, right? I had to have paid them what I owed. By the way, everyone else in this line has a fixed claim. The, the residual claim is the only flexible claim. By the way, when there's a lot of money coming in, 
it's great to be the shareholder, right? Because you're getting all these sweet, sweet leftovers. Sometimes, though, when times are bad, your leftovers are negative, right? And so that's why we say this uh, common shareholder is that they have the riskiest position at the firm. But they have risked their wealth to make this enterprise possible. They deserve to be compensated. And by the way, if we're making them wealthy, we've already paid everybody else. Does that make sense? OK. Now, you may hear people say, oh, but what about stakeholders? And this is the, this is the argument of the day right now. And that is, we don't just want to think about the shareholders. We want to think about all these people who are, who are stakeholders. Well, what kind of, what are stakeholders? They're people who might have an interest, other than a financial interest, in what's going on at the firm. And, and some of these actually do have a financial interest. Uh, we've got the employees. What are the employees interested in? Getting paid is the, the number one thing, right? And then good working conditions, all that. And then we have our customers, we have suppliers, and we have the government, and I'm also going to add the environment in there. So go ahead and write down environment after government. We'll talk about that. If I don't talk about it, remind me. Okay, let's talk about our employees. If I am maximizing shareholder wealth, I am going to take care of my employees. Let me explain to you what happens if I don't. Let's say, uh, in fact, my, my accountant comes to me and he says, our labor costs are too high. And he says, you know, what can we do? And I say, hey, I've got an idea. Let's cut everybody's wages in half. <laughs> Mr. Sadai, what happens? Not, not something very good. Not something very good. OK, so I have a classroom here, and I've got a bunch of people of different levels of ability and ambition, right? And that's just like the shop floor. I, I, had a, I had 31 guys at one point, and I had some that were hard chargers and were doing a great job, and I had others that were slacking off. If I cut wages in half, who's gonna leave? The hard chargers. And who am I left with? Yeah, we call it the cream of the crap, right? <laughs> You're left with the cream of the crap. Now. I've still got half my people left, even though I'm only paying half the money, but they're a bunch of slackers. So what do I do? I hire a guy with a whip and a leather suit, and he goes around and he's, and he's like, get back to work, get back to work, get back to work. Now, what do you think happens to my workforce now? They're not happy. And, and so anyone with half a lick of sense gets out of there, right? And so now who am I left with? Masochists and psychopaths, right? And so now I've really, I've really done a bad thing here. Now, let me ask you this question. Was I maximizing shareholder wealth by treating the employees poorly? No. no. Does that mean I should pay employees way more than they're worth? No. But I should treat them fairly. I should provide good working conditions. I should provide them a fair exchange for what they're giving me. What about customers? This one's easy. What if you treat your customers like crap? Yeah, as long as, long as you're not the only game in town, they're going to go somewhere else, right? And by the way, when we used to have only one phone company, do you know how the phone company treated us? Like crap, right? And so now when you talk to the phone company, they treat you slightly less like crap because there are places, other places you can go, right? Okay, now what about suppliers? What if I treat my suppliers poorly? By the way, typically the way we treat suppliers poorly is by not paying them in a timely manner. That's typical. What if we don't treat our suppliers well? What are they going to do? Cut us off. Yeah, they're going to cut us off. Now, it depends on really the size of your organization. If you are a small business and you are treating your suppliers poorly, it's really easy for them to cut you off. What if you're Walmart? A little more difficult. A little more difficult. And in fact, uh, this has been Christmas 1993. I was working in Walmart General Headquarters and we were doing invoices or we were paying bills for refrigeration companies because you know Walmart's got a lot of coolers and stuff. And we would get the bills. And some of the bills said overdue, and they would say that you know there was this extra penalty on there. And so I, 
I'm just a temporary worker. I hold up my hand and I ask the boss, do we pay the penalty? And he says, no. And he, he, he didn't say screw him. He said something else. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, screw him. We're Walmart. Now, what does that mean? Why, is, why can a Walmart get away with that when you, with your small engine repair shop, can't? They have more power. Yeah, they've got power in the market, right? So power in the market can be as a supplier or as a customer. If you're the biggest customer, you've got market power. If you're the biggest supplier, you've got market power. Okay. I am sure Walmart doesn't do their business like that anymore. <laughs> okay. By the way, we are in a building named after the CEO of Walmart, and we are thankful to their generosity. <laughs> okay, back to the story. Um, so, don't treat your suppliers bad because they'll cut you off. If they cut you off, you can't sell anything, you can't sell anything, you can't make a profit. Is that good for the shareholders? No. And then we've got the government. By the way, if you don't pay your taxes, what's the government going to do? They're going to come down on you, right? There's going to be problems. Do you think it's going to be good for shareholder wealth? No. Okay. Oh, by the way, there are many ways for us to say maximize shareholder wealth. I could say maximize the market value of the equity. I could say maximize the share price. I could say maximize the price of the common shares. I could say maximize the market price of the stock. So many, many ways. But basically, you have to look at each one of those and ask yourself, does that directly correlate to maximizing shareholder wealth? And if it does, then that would be an appropriate answer. I'm telling you this because there will undoubtedly be a multiple choice question. And undoubtedly, the answer will not necessarily be maximize shareholder wealth verbatim. There are many ways to say that. And so you can go back and read your book for some additional ideas on that. OK. Finally, at the end of this, we have the environment. If I don't take care of the environment in the United States, what's going to happen? What's that? It depends. It depends. Sometimes the government regulates that, but also people's opinion. Okay, so uh, let's roll back to 1969. This is before the Environmental Protection Agency, even before I was born. There was a fire on a river in Ohio. The river was so polluted that someone tossed a cigarette and the river caught fire and it actually burnt the bridges over the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. Locals would call it the Cuyahoga River, but I'm, I'm saying it as it's spelled, Cuyahoga. That, the very next year, we got Earth Day and we got the Environmental Protection Agency. And now, if you pollute, the EPA comes after you. And I can tell you from my own experience working in industry that they were pretty on top of things. If we were doing something nasty, they were after us. So. Uh, and you can look country to country, it's a little different. In fact, they've just recently started implementing environmental protection laws in China. But in the United States, if you don't, you eventually are going to get caught, and you're eventually going to have to pay something. What are they called? Fines. And you might even get sued, and so there's legal judgments. And if you don't believe me, you can watch that movie with uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Rob Roberts, Julia Roberts. Aaron Brockovich. You guys ever seen that movie? Yeah. Oh my goodness, my cultural references are all out of touch. Okay, back to the story. You're going to end up spending a lot of money to take care of this problem. And not only are you going to have to pay all the fines in this stuff, but you're going to have to pay to clean this stuff up. Now, let me ask you this. What do you think is cheaper? Preventing pollution or cleaning it up? Preventing is much cheaper. And if you don't believe me, I want you to do this example on the way home. I want you to stop at the store and I want you to buy two two liter bottles of Coca-Cola, the sugary stuff, not that diet crap. And I want you to take both of them to your place of residence and I want you to crack one of them open and pour it down the sink. That is your example of controlling pollution. Now, I want you to take the other one and open it up and pour it on the carpet in your living room. <laughs> And then I want you to see how hard that is to clean up. Which is better? Yeah. So, by the way, are you ever going to get the coal out of the carpet? 
No. No, you basically have to get rid of the carpet and the padding and then like steam the floor or whatever. Okay, so that's my point to you. It's so much cheaper to prevent pollution and comply with these governmental regulations than it is to be a scofflaw. So you would not be maximizing shareholder wealth if you were violating these environmental protection laws. So it turns out that if we are focused on maximizing shareholder wealth, we will be taking care of all these other concerns. It's good to only give managers one goal. I'm going to give you guys the goal of maximizing your points in the class. I mean, that's kind of unspoken, but that's where we're at, right? Now, what if I told you that I was going to give you two goals, and one of those goals was to maximize your points in the class, and the other point, the other uh, goal, was to minimize your carbon footprint. Doesn't that sound nice? Minimize your carbon footprint. Make you feel virtuous. Minimizing your carbon footprint. Now, how can you do that? Just buy an offset. Oh, okay. Well, so you're obviously one of these champagne socialist elites, right? Okay. But what if you don't have cash? What if you're a poor college student, unlike Mr. Green? But, oh, you actually have the name for it, right, Mr. Yeah. Green? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's obviously a Green. Okay, back to the story. Howard. So let's let's ask um, Robertson. Robinson. Robinson. Mrs. Ro Ms. Ms. Robinson. Ms. Oh, Miss. Okay, Miss Robinson. You drive here from Web City. Web City. Um, do you have to do you do you like ride a bicycle? No. No. Do you drive an electric car? No. Uh, so you're you're burning gasoline. Is she minimizing our carbon footprint? No. no. And so now I give you these two goals, and next week she doesn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> and I email her saying, Ms. Robinson, are you okay? And she reads, she's yeah. I'm just minimizing my carbon footprint, right? <laughs> People will always jump on the easy one. People will always jump on the easy one. And so that's why, and it's kind of sick, but right now you hear CEOs saying, oh yeah, we need to focus on, and they're like throwing all this stuff up over here. You're like, oh, sustainability, and let's give shoes to kids, and all sorts of other stuff. Like, look, how about this? You make a profit. You pay me the dividend, and I'll buy shoes for kids that I like. Does that make sense? Because after all, whose money is it anyway? It's mine, right? So you'll hear people throwing out these arguments, and managers are buying into it simply because it means that they don't have to deliver on their top job, or it should be their only job, which is to maximize shareholder wealth. So be careful buying into these fallacious arguments. By the way, fallacious means of or pertaining to a fallacy, if you thought it meant something else. All right. Questions? I used that word one time in class, and this young lady goes, <gasps> Okay, let's talk about regulation. So we've got publicly traded firms. What does that mean? If you're a publicly traded firm, it means you have stock available out there on the stock market. So, if you're a publicly traded firm, you are regulated by the Securities and Exchange Commission. And the Securities and Exchange Commission, by the way, they haven't always been around. They came around after the 1929 stock market crash. It took us like four or five years to get our stuff together, but finally we get the SEC. And the things that they're asking for are not all that uh, unusual in the beginning. They're saying things like, you have to disclose your pertinent financial information. Wouldn't that be something you would want to know if you were going to invest in a firm? Yeah. And so this is stuff that investors should have been demanding prior to, but back then uh, people invested sort of like they do with Robin Hood today where they don't actually know what's going on. They're just like following the herd, right? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Sadai, have you deleted the app? You gotta get my money back. You gotta get your money back. Okay, do that as soon as possible before they totally take it away from you. Back to the story. So they gotta disclose all this pertinent financial information. And by the way, they're gonna do that in audited financial statements. Why do the financial statements have to be audited? Do you think people will lie about money? People are scumbags, right? They're gonna lie. And so we have to have audited financial statements, and we're gonna see later on that that doesn't necessarily mean that they're perfect, but it's better than non-audited. And then roll forward in time, um, we still didn't have the 
situation where there was a, a legal responsibility of the officers for those financial statements to be correct. And so then in 2002, after Enron and some other stuff, WorldCom, we came up with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act that says, oh, by the way, the CEO and the CFO have to sign off that these uh, statements are, to the best of their knowledge, correct. And if we find out later that they're not, then the CFO and the CEO go to prison. Do you think that kind of raised the bar? Yeah. In fact, there were a lot of companies that decided to go dark or go private after that just because they didn't want to have to potentially uh, the CEO and the CFO didn't want to go to prison, right? That makes sense. And by the way, that's good. It cleaned those companies out of the public markets. They're no longer out there for people to invest in. Okay. And then the final thing I want to say about um, uh, the, the final regulation is trading on inside information being illegal. What is inside information? Information. If, yeah, so it's, it's private information and, uh, so private information, the CEO's shoe size, would we care? No. The earnings report for tomorrow, would we care? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's not only private information, it has to, and, and we call it non-public information. And it has to be material, meaning it has to be significant enough that investors would care. Investors would want to know. And so trading on that information is illegal. And the reason it is illegal, who, who is the victim to that crime? Any ideas? Shareholders. Yeah, the other shareholders. I would have sure liked to have known that you guys were going to go bankrupt. I would have sold my shares too. Does that make sense? I was at a, and I won't name the company here, but I was at a, at a meeting, and it was at the corporate headquarters, and the executive vice president of Umpty Squad, I forget his title, but he comes in, and it's a management training class, and there are nine of us, and we're all men, or, or boys at least. And then he says, gentlemen, I can't tell you what the earnings numbers are going to be tomorrow, but I can tell you to buy the stock now. <laughs> Do you think I bought the stock? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, Mr. said, die. Of course I didn't buy the stock, <laughs> right? By the way, the SEC, what did they do? They look at trades before and after news events. And if they see unusual trading beforehand, they're going to kind of track you down. And then they're going, and it might have been just pure luck, right? Or pure coincidence. But if they find out that you work for that company, or that your uncle works for that company, or that your grandma, and it could be that you work for the company, and the weird trading is happening in your grandma's account, they figure that stuff out. If you don't believe me, ask the people who are doing time in federal prison for doing this. And if you have forgotten how terrible federal prison is, remind me and I'll invite my friend to come talk to you guys about what it's like. Okay. Now, um, I will tell you one, uh, it's not illegal in every country. And so I had a guy in my same doctoral program, and he was from South Korea. Mm -hmm. And it was not illegal in South Korea. So he went to work for an for a, uh, investment banker. And he had access to all sorts of inside information on uh, mergers and acquisitions. And he was constantly trading on that information through his wife's account, through his mother's account, his grandma, his sister-in-law. He had all sorts of accounts spread out, including his own. And then the Korean government made that activity illegal. And the very next day, my friend turns in his resignation, and now he's back to being a professor. Because it's just not worth it if you can't cheat yourself to riches, right? Okay, now let's talk about complying with regulations. Is it costly? Yeah, so regulations. In order to understand the regulations, what kind of person must we employ? A regulatory expert is usually going to be some sort of lawyer or accountant. Are these people cheap? No, they may be cheap in their personal lives, but they're expensive to hire, right? And so we end up having to pay a lot for that. Not only that, there might be opportunities that we could undertake if regulations weren't prohibiting us or at least creating a gray area where we are concerned 
that we might wind up running afoul of the government. And so complying with these regulations is costly, and we get back to, there are a lot of firms that simply, after every time we tighten regulations, you'll see this, a lot of firms go private, so they are no longer under those regulations because it was just too costly to get along with it. Now, here's the sick thing. Every one of these regulations gets brought on by an accounting scandal. And after every single one of them, we have greater requirements for accounting. And so, what does that mean for employment among accountants after a scandal? It goes up! Can you imagine having a job where you could create the own, your demand for your own product? <laughs> That's what they've been doing. Okay, any questions? Okay, now let's move on to the agency problem. Let's talk a little bit about corporate governance. We talked last time about how the shareholders elect the board of directors. The board of directors are supposed to represent the shareholders' interests, and now we know that the goal is to maximize the, the wealth of the shareholders. They fire, hire, compensate, and fire the managers, which are, includes the CEO. In fact, typically what they do is they hire the CEO, and they let him or her select their own team. And the reason you do that is so people can work with people that they know and trust. Does that make sense? When I went to Halliburton, uh, we had just had a, a guy come in from GE, and he brought a lot of people with him from GE because he knew them, he trusted them. Now, let's ask this. If we've got the board of directors, and they're responsible for hiring, compensating, and firing the CEO, and the CEO is the chair of the board, do you see a conflict of interest there? Yeah, so let's, let's picture I'm one of these chair CEO dual people and I come into the board meeting and I say, okay folks, I'm here today as the chairman of the board, I'm taking off my CEO hat, I am just the chairman of the board. By the way, on today's agenda, I see that we have the salary package for the CEO. Isn't he a great guy? I mean, what a great job he's done. I know he's had some rough times here as of late, but wow. How amazing how he's been resilient under all the stress. I think we should give him a 45% raise. <laughs> Do you see why that's a problem, right? And you might think that the other board members would say, forget you, pal, that's nuts. Not necessarily so. Do the board members know the CEO? Yeah. Do they necessarily know the shareholders? No. Do you think they play golf with the shareholders? No. Do you think their kids go to the same private school? As the shareholders? No, my kids don't even go to prep school. I don't even have kids, right? So <laughs> my point to you is that the board is probably more chummy with the CEO, and you'll actually see the board, it's called the captured board, where they basically just go along with what the CEO tells them. And we see that all the time. So one of the ways that we can help to defuse that situation is to get rid of this dual CEO chairman of the board relationship, or chairperson of the board relationship. In fact, it's illegal in the United Kingdom for that to be together. In the United States, we are moving toward getting rid of that situation, but we still have it at some companies today. Any questions? Okay. Now, let's talk about the agency problem. That is when you expend other people's resources differently than you would expend your own. Now, let me give you an example. You go home for the winter break, and you, uh, your, your dad says, oh, I need to go to the store. Can you take me? And you say, sure. And you get in your car, and your dad says, your car is an absolute piece of junk. You need a new car. What do you say? <laughs> OK, then we're going to get to that. Now, your dad says, you need to get a new car. Let's go get you a new car. And you're like, yeah. Now, right now, who do you assume is paying for the car? Your dad. Your dad, right? Now, I want you to picture in your head the car that your dad is going to buy you. Do you have it in your head? OK. Now, um, you are driving to the mile of cars in your hometown because every town has one, the mile of cars, right? And you get there, and your dad says, by the way, 
You're paying for it. <laughs> I want you to picture in your head the car that you have in mind now. Did the car change? Absolutely. Yeah, Mr. Bow Richter, what was your first car? Uh, the first car was Bronco. A Bronco, like the, the big one with the leaky roof or the little one? No, like, or I don't know, the big one. The big one, yeah. the big one with the leaky roof. Okay, so, uh, but after you found out you're paying for it, what is the vehicle? Uh, something very fuel efficient. Yeah, something like a Toyota Corolla, right? Because you assumed Dad was going to pay for the gas, too. Okay. Do you view yourself as a terrible person? No, that's human, right? That's just how humans think. It's called rational self-interest. Now, let's ask this question. If you think about, at the company, um, who's making the decisions on how to spend the money? Is it the shareholders? No, it's the managers. And so the managers have control over how to spend the shareholders' money. And so that's the first place that this comes from. In fact, it's the, it's the place where it comes from is the separation of ownership and control. I own stock in a lot of companies, but I don't have any control over how their managers spend the money. The managers may own some of the stock, but they don't own very much of it. And so as a result, they're going to spend that money differently than their own. And it's even worse when we have a corporation that's publicly traded. Let me explain to you why. Let's think about this. If we are partners, let's say um, that uh, you and I are partners, and it's 50-50. If you waste a dollar of the firm's money, how much of your own money are you actually wasting? Well, 50 <laughs> cents, right? 50 cents. Okay, now all four of us are in business together, and you waste a dollar of the firm's money. How much does it cost you? A quarter! And, and, and you don't have to be evil to think this way. My sister is a relatively decent person. Um, she's a partner in a four-person organization. And uh, so I go to her house and I see this amazing computer screen and it's like almost floating in midair. It's just freaking amazing. It's curved and it's whew, huge. And, and I'm like, wow, how much did that cost? And it was ridiculous. I forget how much. But she says, but I only really have to pay 25% of that, right? Is she a bad person? No, she just knows how to do the math. Now, here's the problem. Every time I waste a dollar, it only, only costs me a quarter. Every time you waste a dollar, it only costs you a quarter. Every time you waste a dollar, it only costs you a quarter. Every time you waste a dollar, it only costs you a quarter. What does that mean about the amount of money that gets wasted at her farm? It's huge, right? Now, let's talk about what happens when the managers own even less of the firm. I had, and I'm going to cut this story short for the sake of brevity, I had a boss. So when I was first a salesman, they, my boss says, I'm going to go with you to meet your customers. And so I was talking to the other salespeople, and I said, wow, that's really nice of Bob. You know, I've never done sales before. And, and they laughed, and they said, it's not nice of Bob. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to get out there, and on the first night, he's going to take you to an expensive restaurant. You're going to rack up a big bill. And then he's going to slide the bill over to you. I said, what? They said, yeah, just wait. Sure enough, it's exactly what happened. Long story short, we've got, oh, by the way, if you ask a server, anyone here a server at a restaurant? If I ask you, uh, what's good today, what are you going to tell me? Most expensive. The most expensive one. Why? Because you're expecting a? Tip based on the percentage. percentage, right? And so Bob asks the, the server for what's best, and of course she tells him something extravagantly expensive, right? Because so that's the first example of the agency problem that we see. The second is that Bob orders not only this steak, which was called the manhole cover, it's that big, right? <laughs> he orders one of all of the side dishes, including asparagus which just is like sad and limp, right? So he orders, if it's expensive, he orders all of that stuff and a bottle of wine. Now let's talk about the best value on the wine list at a restaurant. What do most people order when they go to a restaurant? Do they order the cheapest wine on the menu? Depends on the restaurant. 
You guys are <laughs> far too sophisticated. <laughs> Typically, for the uninitiated, what they do is they get the second cheapest wine on the menu. Why the second cheapest? They don't want to look cheap, right? They are cheap, but they don't want to look cheap. Do you think restaurant owners know that? Of course. Of course. What do you think is the worst value on the whole wine list? <laughs> That's the second from the bottom, right? That's the worst value on the entire line wine list. By the way, Bob wasn't limited by that because after all, he's spending, is it his money? No. In fact, Bob owns 1% of the firm. That's something I hadn't told you yet. Bob owns 1% of the firm. Okay, at the end of the night, the bill is $300. And keep in mind, this is like 2002. Oh, oh yeah, oh yeah. And so, and, and Bob has been flirting with the waitress who's eight and a half months pregnant. He's been flirting with her the whole night, and he says, give her a good tip. Because after all, he has slid the bill over to me. Now, uh, so I'm going to give her a good tip. Uh, so let's say I threw 50 bucks on there. I think that was roughly it. And then, um, why do I not care that I'm, I mean, this is on my, my expense account, right? Why do I not care? I don't own any of the firm shares, right? And so now the bill is 350 bucks. How much is Bob actually spending for this dinner? $3.50, which is, by the way, what Bob would spend on himself at Taco Bell when he was on his own dime. Does that make sense? Now, do you, do you see how the separation of ownership and control leads to these problems? Now picture yourself as a CEO of one of these huge multi-billion dollar kinds of companies. What kinds of things are you going to engage in? So let's talk about that. Now, by the way, am I telling you to do these things? No. My colleagues in management, sometimes they say, oh, we shouldn't teach students about the agency problem because then they'll go and act out these behaviors. And I say, that's like saying you shouldn't teach your kids about sex because then they won't have sex, right? This is human nature. People are going to do this stuff. And so why am I telling you this? Because you need to be in a position to control this kind of behavior among your own employees, right? OK. Now, wasteful spending. What about corporate jets? You guys know what a corporate jet is, private jet? First of all, terrible for the environment. Most of the time, the CEOs that are flying these things are, you know, they're great advocates for the environment, and then what do they do? You're going out and flying in a private jet. And so it's like uh, 40 times worse than, than first class for as far as your carbon footprint goes. Now, let's make it even worse. True story, uh, Jeff Immel, the CEO of GE at the time, he not only had his private jet, he had an identical jet following along. Why? Just in case the first one broke down, <laughs> God forbid Jeff have to get a first class ticket with you people, <laughs> right? Now, do you think the shareholders, by the way, do you think the shareholders knew about the second jet? No. They didn't know until after he was gone that that finally came out. And, and CEOs will actually make the arguments, oh, my time is so valuable. Um, and, you know, I've got to be protected and this kind of stuff. So they'll make these arguments for private jets. And that, that all sounds legitimate until you learn that when the CEO, go, CEO goes on vacation on their own dime, that they fly commercial, right? If they're really, if all these things they're saying are true, shouldn't they also be flying private for their leisure time? But they're not. People are scumbags. Okay. You also see these huge... Um, vanity projects like Apple's headquarters. You guys know about Apple's headquarters? It looks like a freaking spaceship, right? It look, it's a vanity project for Tim Cook and it started out Steve Jobs and he died. Anyway, uh, vanity project. Now, the real funny thing is they, they sunk over a billion dollars or whatever into this thing and then what happens? COVID. COVID. Totally unoccupied, right? Okay, so that's the kind of wasteful spending we're looking at here. And then we see empire building. Now, let's discuss, there's, there is nothing wrong with acquiring a firm if doing so maximizes shareholder wealth. There's nothing wrong with acquiring a firm as long as doing so maximizes shareholder wealth. However, do you think all acquisitions do that? 
No, in fact, sometimes the acquisitions are more for the pleasure of the CEO than anything else. Let's give some examples. By the way, I'm just going to throw some, some numbers out here. Um, Mr. Hawkes, you are the CEO of a $100 million in assets company. Remind me of your last name? Holman. Holman. You are the CEO of a $200 million assets company. Which one of these guys is more important? He is. Which one of these guys has a bigger office? He does. Which one of these guys um, gets better tea time at the golf course? He does. Which one of these guys has a more attractive mistress? Uh, well, no, you're, I know you're giving him credit for the naturally curly hair, but a hundred million bucks, right? Okay. Uh, Mr. Green, apparently my camera is attracted to you. This thing's about as well behaved as my dogs. Okay, so, do you start to see why it's good to be the CEO of a big company, right? And so, what does this mean? It means Mr. Hawkins says, I can golf at the same club he does. I'm going to go out and we're going to start an acquisition, a string of acquisitions, so we can get the company up to 100, or 200 million in assets. Now, that would be perfectly fine if all the companies you were buying would maximize shareholder wealth. But do you think it's likely that they do? In fact, it's quite unlikely. We're going to learn that in Chapter 21. Okay. And so what he does is he goes out and not only does he buy things that are maybe not the best acquisitions, but he buys things that are of interest to him. For instance, there is an American industrial conglomerate named Eaton, E-A-T-O-N. And E-A-T-O-N, Eaton, um, and, and keep in mind, I, I haven't really researched them for a long time because I, I, it's been 25 years since I got a job offer from them. Anyway, so I did my research back then, and they had industrial electrical equipment. They had industrial hydraulic equipment. They had industrial this, industrial that, and, da, 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 and the golf grips division. Anyone here play golf? What's a golf grip? <laughs> thing you hold. Yeah, the thing you hold up at the top. What does that have to do with hydraulic motors? You can tell I can't play golf, right? Um, what does that have to do with hydraulic motors? Nothing. Why do you think the CEO would have been interested in buying a golf grips company? He what? Oh, he not only gets them for free, but what else? Where are we going to hold the board meetings? Near a golf course. Right? Golf courses to CEOs are like fresh litter boxes to cats. Right? It just attracts them like flies. And so he, he, he gets this golf grips, and then we're able to hold all of our, this year we're doing Pebble Beach. Next year it's going to be Hilton Head. And then we're going to do the old course at St. Andrews. Do you see how this works? It made no sense whatsoever for them to buy that. It's obvious, obvious, obvious that it's one of these empire building activities. Don't do that. Only acquire businesses that are going to maximize shareholder wealth. Now let's talk about shirking. Anybody know what shirking is? Another new skip school. Yeah, it's the opposite of working. It's the opposite of working. Now, you uh, might not even think about CEOs being able to shirk, but they can, right? So uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of pers a personal example. I had an employee named Roy in Dallas, Texas. And this is how Roy would move when he was working for me. He was very slow. He would go down to the tool room and he's like, oh, hey, how are the kids? Did you get to do any fishing this weekend? Yeah. And then he talks for maybe 10, 15 minutes. And then he does this. He says, well, I better get moving before Haggard sees me, right? And he says, go ahead and give me the 98 double lot whatever tool that he was looking for. And then he goes back. And he goes back very slowly, of course. Now, one weekend, my wife and I are out driving around, and we happen to drive by Roy's house. 
And something you need to know about Roy is that even though he was a 42-year-old man, which seemed old to me at the time, but now it does not, he was a 42-year-old man, his hobby was racing go-karts. Now, can you just go out and buy racing go-karts? Maybe you can now, but back then you had to build them, right? And so Roy's out there working on his racing go-kart, and this is what it looked like. Yeah. <laughs> he is moving like I slam on the brakes. My wife says, what's wrong? I said, there's something wrong with Roy, right? Now, why do you think Roy was working so hard at his house and so not hard at my, on my shop floor? It's the agency problem. Who's getting 100% of the benefit of Roy's work when he's at home? He is. And by the way, his wife's probably told him he also has to mow the yard or he can't go racing tomorrow, right? So he's probably in a hurry. Ladies, keep that in mind if you want the yard mode. Okay, back to the story. So, but on my, when, when he's working for me, what does he do? He works only hard enough to keep from getting fired. Does that make sense? Okay, that's shirking. CEOs will do the same thing. And the older that they get, the bigger the problem is. We'll talk about why that is. Uh, we don't want to see that. Okay. <laughs> Those are my old glasses, like three glasses ago. Okay, so how do we control the agency problem? Well, first of all, managerial compensation contracts. If I just pay you a million dollars a year, and regardless of, the, of your output, what are you, how are you going to behave? You're going to shirk, right? You're not going to care. And so what I want to do is give you a compensation contract that aligns your interests with those of the shareholders. We need to align your interests with those of the shareholders. So how are we gonna do that? Stock options, stock grants. We're going to give you a bonus when the stock hits a certain level. Now, we're not gonna do things based on accounting numbers because after all, managers have a lot of discretion over accounting. And if we do it based on accounting numbers, then they will just kind of try to jigger the accounting numbers. And so I was talking to a friend of mine who runs a railroad, and his name is Greg. And, uh, I, and, I, and I always want to hear about how my material gets applied in the real world. And I said, uh, Greg, do you guys think about maximizing shareholder wealth? And he said, no. I said, what do you think about? He says, I think about maximizing Greg's bonus, <laughs> right? Greg's bonus isn't based on the share price. It's based on some numbers of which Greg has partial control of, right? Does that make sense? So we don't want to use accounting numbers for that. Okay, so we're going to compensate them to align their interests, to make them think more like an owner. Number two, there's the managerial labor market. You may not think of managers as labor, but they are. I'm labor. I'm standing up here uh, and trading my time for money. That makes me labor. Does that make sense? Even though I'm wearing a tie, I am labor. Okay, so the managerial labor market. There is a labor market out there for CEOs, and that market doesn't have a whole lot of people in it, right? And when you do something bad as a CEO, it gets published in the Wall Street Journal. And so I do something bad as a CEO, it gets published in the Wall Street Journal, my company fires me. Now, when I go out and apply for new jobs, what happens? Yeah. Probably out of luck, right? And so, uh, what that, that might not, uh, uh, so in this example, the person's already done the bad behavior. But knowing that, might I restrain my bad behavior to try to avoid winding up in the Wall Street Journal and to try to avoid getting fired? Absolutely. So that's how the managerial labor market constrains these things. And then we have the market for corporate control. Uh, we're talking about takeovers here, mergers, acquisitions, that sort of stuff. If your share price is high, your company is hard to take over because people will have to pay a lot for it. But if you are a bad manager and your share price gets really low, then I could probably write a check for your company, right? It'd be real easy for me to take it over. Now, why would the CEO care if I were going to take over their firm? I'm going to fire them, right? Because after all, they're the clown that drove the share price down to where it is now, right? And so they don't want the company to get taken over because they don't want to lose their jobs. And so as a result, they are incentivized to try to keep the share price at least high enough that the firm isn't an attractive takeover. 
firm or target. And then we have monitoring. Monitoring is when you keep your eyes on someone. In fact, you guys are going to take your exams through something called Respondus Monitor. What is that? Anybody use that before? What is it? It's the lockdown browser. Uh-huh. The, the camera. Monitor. Now, let's ask this question and, and be honest. When are you more likely to behave yourself? When you're being watched. When you're being watched. I didn't even have to give the choices. She jumped right on it. <laughs> when you're being watched. I gave this talk in a night class one time. I had a guy in the back row. I said, you know, those cameras in Taco Bell, uh, you guys may not be so low brow as to eat in Taco Bell, but I am. Uh, go to Taco Bell. There are cameras everywhere. Do you know what the most important camera in that whole store is? The cash register. Why? Yeah, people, the, the employees steal from the managers or the, the owners. And, and the guy in the corner laughed. I said, what are you laughing about? He says, I'm a manager at Taco Bell. He says, that's the only camera in my whole store that actually works. <laughs> okay, that's monitoring. Now, we can do similar things with CEOs. We can try to figure out whether they've got the extra plane trailing, and they've got all sorts of things we can do to try to figure out if they're doing their jobs correctly. Who do you think is more likely to act in the shareholder's interest? One who is being watched or one who basically you knows that there's nobody looking. The one who's being watched, right? So that's monitoring. Are there any questions? <laughs>